Would you please be seated? When the creators of the lectionary text, that is these texts that we use on Sunday mornings, come into agreement and, and we find that there's a common theme, it's, it's important that I address it. And so, obviously, this morning's Old Testament and Gospel include a deep conversation about the Sabbath. And so this morning, I should like to spend some time talking about the Sabbath. How do you keep the Sabbath in your own lives, or, or do you? Is it something that you even think about? Clearly, we don't think about it as much as um, the Pharisees and the Herodians that we see in this morning's gospel. But there is an invitation in this story and the scripture this morning for us to think about what this subject means for us and for God's church. Sabbath, of course, um, means the seventh day, and it is born um, in the story that we see at, in, at the Genesis, literally the Genesis, the creation story of the world, and it is on the seventh day that God rests. And since that time, there has been a story, uh, uh, there's been a, this idea that that seventh day should be set aside as a day devoted to God and to thinking about how to serve God and serve each other. And so it originates in Genesis, but, but it becomes kind of formalized when Moses brings the Ten Commandments and we hear, this, we hear one of those commandments being to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then, of course, there's this morning scripture from the Old Testament where, in Deuteronomy where, where what actually could and could not be done on the Sabbath is, is starting to unfold. Now, this gets a little bit complex, doesn't it? Because while the Old Testament and, and, and those, the stories that I told you all seem to be kind of thematically linked together and, and, and would allow us to imagine a, a single way of understanding the Sabbath, then we get the gospel from, from Mark where we have two stories about the ways in which Jesus acts on the Sabbath, which seems to run, um, run afoul of the religious authorities of his day. And so into this space between kind of these in-between times, right, and this, and this questioning of, of what the Sabbath meant and, and what it meant to Jesus and what it means to us, there's an opportunity for us to have a bit of a conversation. One of the things that you should know is that, um, that part of, of Jesus' arrival in the world was, was the, the truth that he laid out for them, that he was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That is to say that, that the ways in which um, the, the people that he came from um, were, were organized was around, in many ways, adherence to the law and looking back at what the prophets told him. And Jesus' arrival meant that all that was up for discussion again. And as we know, into discussion sometimes comes an opportunity for disagreement. By the time the second and third and fourth centuries arrived, um, those early Christians, even though they weren't formalized, were, were starting to reject the celebration of the Sabbath in its formal way and, the, and all of the restrictions on activity that were associated with it in the Old Testament. Because this is because it was considered this keeping of the, the Sabbath as part of the ceremonial law which was abolished in Christ's arrival. Instead, though, they did something else. They recognized that there was an important thing to be done. They just, uh, let's just say they transferred it. And instead of keeping the Sabbath, which lasts from sundown on Friday evening till sundown on Saturday morning, they, they moved this day of devotion to God onto the day that they called the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection. We call it Sunday. Now, with the exception of, of Seventh-day Adventists and a few other Christian groups, most Christians move this idea of the Sabbath um, to, to the Sunday morning. And we, we also kind of set aside this time to, to think through kind of what it means for us to be in relationship with each other, the wider world, and with God. And, and, and if you want to know the truth, it actually gets even more complex than that. And, and of course, it has to do with our Anglican brothers and sisters. In, in the 16th and 17th centuries, um, a group arrived 
called the Sabbatarians. That's a good name, isn't it? The Sabbatarians. And there are these Christians, usually English or Scottish Calvinists, who applied the Old Testament prohibitions to work on Sunday, deeming it the Christian Sabbath. And this, of course, was a point of conflict between the Anglicans, our ancestors, and those Puritans in the 16th and 17th century. And based on this conflict and the conversation about what Sunday was for, what the Christian Sabbath was for, arose these great things that we call blue laws. Do you know blue laws? Maine, it turns out, actually has a number of blue laws. And in fact, I was thinking about it um, this weekend. I looked it up. It's like, what are Maine's blue laws? Did you know that you can't buy a car on Sundays? Did you know that you can't hunt on Sundays? Those animals get a day of rest, I guess, right? And it wasn't too long ago that you couldn't buy alcohol on Sundays. But, but you know what changed? St. Patrick's Day fell on a Sunday. <laughs> and those lawmakers heard from their constituencies that, um, well, things had to change. And so in 2015, the, 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 the time in which you could buy alcohol on Sundays changed to be the same as the other days. But we also, have other, um, we also have other blue laws here in Maine. Did you know that you can't, that, that big box stores and grocery stores cannot be open on Christmas Day and on Easter and on Thanksgiving? This is kind of our, our way of legally kind of proclaiming that there's something different about this day, the Sabbath. Now, I grew up in a time that was between, um, between this conflict. Maybe, maybe you remember it. And this was, this was a time where, when I was a child, I heard about days in which nothing happened on Sundays. But by the time I arrived, we could have soccer, but not until the afternoon. The one thing that I do remember was going to the grocery store after church and standing in line and letting people go in front of us one after the other and wondering why this was until I realized that at 12.01 my mom could buy a bottle of wine. <laughs> what is the Sabbath for? What, is, what are we supposed to make of, of, these, of these ways in which the law has, has prohibited some things and allowed other things? This is the conversation, actually, that Jesus is having with the Pharisees and the Herodians about what it's meant actually to do and how it's meant to kind of allow us to see God's relationship with us and the world. At first glance, when we hear those two readings, those two kind of separate stories in the Gospel of Mark, these are the only two that address the Sabbath, and Mark puts them together. Um, he seems to be saying that, that he wants to strip away the power of the Sabbath. And in fact, what he says is, the Sabbath was made for humankind. And, and what he's saying there is that, is that the, the, the Sabbath, that is the law of keeping this thing uh, kind of very, very severely, was meant for humans to understand that all that they have is from God, and all that they do is for God's glory. That was the purpose of the Sabbath. And Jesus is reminding them that, that the Sabbath was made for humankind. But if you really want to know the truth, this, this morning's gospel and the story of Jesus healing on the, on these, on the Sabbath and, and him feeding his, his disciples on the Sabbath is actually an attempt to help his followers and actually help us to understand that with Jesus, something new is happening. And that in his saving grace, this understanding of, of what we must do, what we must do, falls away and what God is doing for us comes forward. One of the more intriguing parts about this morning's gospel is that by the end of, of, by the end of it, you've got these two various groups, Herodians and Pharisees, who are conspiring together to kill Jesus, which, which doesn't say much about the Sabbath, does it? They were really serious about it, or so it would seem. And on one hand, it is a conflict about the Sabbath, isn't it? 
Jesus is following his disciples through the field and they pick grains to eat, which of course was legal. This was called gleaning. That hungry people could come and, and take a handful of grain to fill their stomachs. And he also goes into the temple and, and heals a man directly in their face, which is, which is a way in which he's, he's actually confronting them with what it is they believe and how what they say they believe is different from what God is telling them that it's for. This is a beautiful thing for us to consider, that the Gospel of Mark places these two stories together and depicts conflict. There is conflict here. means that it's meant to invite a question, both from those around him and from us. What is so dangerous about Jesus? What is so dangerous about feeding the hungry? What is so dangerous about healing the sick? Do we want to join the Pharisees and Herodians and end it to put Jesus to death over this new way? Clearly, this conflict over the Sabbath is actually about something else, isn't it? All of Jesus' stories, these parables, and these ways in which he invites us into this conversation is actually about something else. Yes, there's some practical considerations about feeding and about healing and about working and all of those things, but, but at its heart, this is about how in which, how we are going to relate to God and how we're going to relate to the world. Can I tell you that... Um, that over the years, as I've heard the story, I actually love preaching against the Pharisees and the Herodians. And you want to know why? I come from a family of lawyers. And, 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 and if you look at, at these, as these groups, as, as people who are, who are adhering to the letter of the law, I love tearing them down, and it drives my father, my father-in-law, my brother, and my brother-in-law nuts. But today, I want to tell you that what I see in these Pharisees and the Herodians is actually not some kind of, um, some kind of um, challenge and legalistic, hard-hearted and difficult people. What I see are faithful people trying to live out in their own way a faithful relationship to God. They're just trying to do it by setting out a list of rules and checking off the boxes which I have to tell you is really appealing sometimes, isn't it? To just know what to do and what to say, and, and, and that will be it? Man, I might want to be a lawyer. But what Jesus comes and does is something different. He's offering a new vision of life and a new vision of God that is less about checking off our boxes and letting God do God's work. And I have to tell you, that's a lot harder. And I have to tell you, that's also really threatening. Nib Stroop says it this way, Jesus is proclaiming in word and in deed a new way of understanding who God is. Jesus proclaims to his generation and to every generation, including ours, that God is not confined to our rules about God or about our way of perceiving God. Jesus is reconfiguring our relationship to God, not just as individuals, but in the structures of society as well. And such a reconfiguration is threatening. Why were they so angry? Well, it was because the way in which their society was ordered was falling away. Change is hard. When I think about what Jesus is actually offering, and when I think about what this story is actually about, I think about the opportunity we have to accept the reconfiguration that Jesus offers for us as individuals, 
for the community of the Cathedral of St. Luke, for the city of Portland, and even for the whole world. This reconfiguring does not go down easy. In fact, what we're noticing in our world is that the reconfiguring people do not go down without a fight, do they? We want to act as though we are in charge. And this morning's gospel reminds us that there is only one person, one person, and that person is God. In a sense, then, what Jesus is doing in this this morning's gospel is calling us back to the original meaning of that Sabbath commandment. If we see the Sabbath commandment uh, uh, as an invitation for us to, to look to God and to give thanks and to recognize that all that we have and all that we are is a product of God's love, that is indeed a Sabbath worth keeping. Now, over the years, we've, we've fought about what that would look like by prohibiting um, buying beer before 1201. But in truth, this is an opportunity for us to actually consider what it means for us to live all of our lives in the Sabbath time. Thinking about the enormity of all that we've been given and how that changes our relationship to each other, ourselves, and to the world. And don't worry. Do not worry if you're feeling, well, like I am sometimes, threatened by this way in which this disordering of things opens up a space that can feel like brokenness, but is actually openness to God's work. I hope you have a blessed Sabbath on this day and on every day that it reminds you that God is indeed at the center of all things, especially our hearts. Amen. Our service continues as we stand and affirm our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.